welcome everybody and thanks for coming to this new economics briefing on building a caring economy. Uh, my name is Sophie and I work for NEF. Uh, for those of you who don't know NEF, um, it's a think tank that works to build a new economy for people and planet. Um, it's really exciting to have so many people on the call today. There's loads of us, over 150 people. Um, please do say who you are and where you are calling from in the chat box. And if you're part of an organisation, why not give them a shout out as well. Please do feel free to tweet about this event using the hashtag, hashtag NEFBriefing to help spread the word. Uh, in lieu of the budget this year, which is obviously not happening, we wanted to put together a mini series of new economics briefings based around what a budget for recovering from COVID might look like. We're very excited about how this mini series is shaping up. So please make sure that you're signed up to our mailing list to receive updates about future events. So this event today is co-hosted by the UK Women's Budget Group to celebrate the launch of their impressive and far-reaching report on creating a caring economy. I'll post a link to the report in the chat now and we'll be discussing its findings throughout the event tonight. Care has never been more of a politically salient issue from the fact that more and more of us are reliant on paid and on unpaid forms of care to the recognition of carers as key workers in the public consciousness. As we hurtle towards the likelihood of further lockdown restrictions, our care system could soon be in danger of being unindated again with the second wave of coronavirus. But what if things were different? What would it look like to put care at the heart of building a new economy after coronavirus? What kinds of new social infrastructure do we need to put in place? How can we put an emphasis on care and rebalance our economy fundamentally towards wealth, wellness and gender equality, as well as protecting us from the virus and in ecological breakdown. To discuss this and more this evening, I'm very excited to be joined by four fantastic guests. First, we will hear from NEF's very own senior economist, Sarah Arnold. Sarah will talk about why we should be investing in a caring economy right now. Then we will hear from three of the commissioners from the UK Women's Budget Group, Commission on Gender Equal Economy, which has produced this, a new report, which we have linked to in the chat and we'll be linking to throughout tonight. First up is Neil Lawson, Executive Director of Compass. Neil will talk um, about the politics of building a care econo caring economy, as well as the experimentation in new forms of care. Next, we will hear from Dr. Zubaida Haq, former Interim Director for of the Runnymede Trust, a member of the Ind Independent Sage. Zubaida will talk about how a caring economy can level up inequalities that already exist within society. And finally, we will hear from Neff Fellow and Director of Prime Economics and Petafor. And we'll talk about how a caring economy can fulfill the need to respond to the climate emergency. As ever, we really want to hear from you this evening. So please post any comments and questions you have in the chat box as the speakers are talking and we will do our best to ask those questions to them. We're looking to wrap up tonight around eight o'clock, so we do apologize if we don't get to your questions, but please do have that conversation in the chat as much as you can. Right then, without further ado, let's hear from our first speaker. Sarah Arnold, are you out there? Hi there, is my mic all right and everything? It is all right, thank you. So Sarah is a senior economist at NEF. Um, Sarah, why should we be invest investing in a caring economy now? And what might some policy for a caring economy look like? Sure, well, I think, as you, as you made quite clear in your introduction, this crisis has absolutely exposed many of the fragilities in our care system, um, particularly the crisis in care homes. So care homes received a lot of attention um, because death rates were um, unacceptably high um, and there were serious concerns about um, the ability of the sector to respond. Um, but beyond care homes, the childcare sector has particularly struggled um, particularly financially, so this crisis has exposed the weakness in the financial systems and around, I think it's one in four childcare um, providers are expected to close over the next year without further support. And there's also been a huge surge in informal care of, of people taking care of their, of their family members and of their friends informally. So I think this crisis has really exposed some of those fragilities in the care system, but at the same time, it's also obviously exposed um, clear fragilities in our economic system. And in particular, we have a very high level of unemployment right now, which is very high and is currently rising. 
Um, even some of the best estimates suggest, um, or the most optimistic estimates from the Bank of England suggest that around one in 10 people um, are likely to be unemployed by the end of the year. Um, and that's a particular problem both for the, for the people experiencing that and their families and, and their livelihoods, but also because um, the impact and the domino effect this might potentially have on the wider economy and on everyone else's um, lives and jobs. So there is a particular concern with this recession that the more people lose their jobs and the less money people have to spend in the economy as a result of that, the domino effect this might have and the permanent scarring effect this might have on the economy. So it's very incumbent upon the government to create more jobs and to do much more. I mean, the government is doing things through its job support scheme um, and other things, but these are very reliant on supporting and protecting the jobs that already exist. And what we need is much more support um, and more jobs for people who've already lost their jobs and people who won't be able to keep their jobs. And as such, care is actually a really good opportunity for investment for the government as well. Um, firstly, because it's a current and future source of sustainable demand. So care work will absolutely be needed now and it will be needed in the future. We have huge levels of vacancies in the current care sector. Many people, um, the, the system needs more people working there. Brexit is likely to make that worse in that we'll have less people, um, less people likely applying. Um, but also in the future, our demographic shift, we have an aging population, we have people living with more comorbidities, we are likely to need much more care in the future. Secondly, care is distributed, the needs for care is distributed throughout the country. Um, unlike some big infrastructure projects that need to happen in one particular place, people across the country need care and so it's something that can be invested in that will support with the leveling up agenda um, and finally care jobs are a good investment from um, a public fiscal stimulus perspective because those jobs are they're needed now and they're shovel ready so a lot of these big infrastructure projects that the government has been talking about to stimulate the economy they take time to set up they take time to get planning permission whereas right now people need care and people need support so Care is a good opportunity for investment because um, it's needed now, it's distributed across the country and it, um, it's essentially shovel ready. So we need to create more new jobs in care. Um, but beyond that, there's other ways that, um, that investment in care can support um, the economy and can support people using the care system. So it's not just about creating new jobs in care, it's also about improving the care, pay conditions and training for current staff because currently staff that work in the care sector, um, around 50% are paid below living wage um, and around one in five have absolutely no training upon starting, which is not good for people in the job and it's not good for the people they're supporting either. So that needs to be changed. And finally, there needs to be better support, um, particularly including some financial support for informal carers. Um, particularly in this COVID context, as I said earlier, a lot more people are stepping up and taking care of their family members, but the pressure that is putting on people and then their ability to also perform their other functions, um, working um, in their jobs, supporting other people, living their, living their lives happily and well, um, is impacted. And so we need also better support for informal carers. Um, so I think I'll stop there rather than talk too much. I can answer further questions later. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we've had uh, a question sent in uh, via email by Anne. Probably not Anne Petable, but who can say? It could have been. Um, about um, sort of the connection between local authorities and the sort of the national. So um, a lot of what we're talking about here in terms of investment is a national level investment. Um, but to what extent can local authorities be begin building a caring economy now, it, it, you know, given what we're going through and the amount of um, the amount of stuff they're dealing with and the lack of investment they have. Um, so basically, how can local authorities start on this journey? Well, yeah, I mean, the part of the problem with social care is that it's really complicatedly both funded and provided. So although I'm talking about kind of the need for funding on a national scale, what this actually would mean um, would be an increase in local authority budgets because it's local authority budgets that care spending, at least social care, comes out of. Um, so really right now, I mean, local authorities can, can get on with as much as they can, and I think they have been doing that. But really what local authorities need to do right now is to come together and lobby the government and make it really clear that more money is needed 
um, in order to uh, continue to ensure that this stuff can actually happen at a reasonable standard. Great, thank you. And um, a, we've got a question from the chat from Sid, who says, does a guaranteed jobs policy have a place in a caring economy? Look, I'm, I'm sympathetic behind the reasoning for a guaranteed jobs policy. Um, I think some of the outcomes that it's aiming to achieve, um, kind of security for people, ensuring everybody who wants one is able to get a job. So I think I can see why that might be a policy that might that people might go for. I think the alternative, though, is providing um, a minimum income guarantee or a minimum level of income support for people, regardless of whether they're working or whether they're not, um, would ensure that people have that same level of security and will allow people to um, live their lives with kind of dignity and a bit more choice. Because the problem with a jobs guarantee is that it essentially puts a primacy on the kind of work that we already pay for and value within the economy. And so it's particularly difficult for people who are informal carers, for example, they might have a job guarantee, but that means they'll still be struggling between and splitting their time between providing that informal support and doing their job. Whereas if you provided um, some kind of improved social security or better income support for those people, they wouldn't have to make so those difficult decisions, they'd have a better um, quality of life and they'd be able to make the choice that works for them, rather than the government dictating that certain jobs have certain um, social value. Thank you, Sarah. That was fantastic. And I'm not, I'm going to stop questioning you to within an inch of your life now. Um, Sarah did a good job there of plugging her work on the minimum income guarantee, which it, you can read on the NEF website, it's very good. Um, and Sarah is also authoring some work for NEF on the very area of social infrastructure, which will be published in the next month or so. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, now, before I move on to our next speaker, I do just want to take a second to plug NEF Supporters Network. Uh, if the vision Sarah just outlined sounds like something you'd like to get behind, then you can join the Supporters Network for as little as three pounds a month. Supporters donations help fund our work, including running events like this, and allow us to plan further ahead into the future. If you are a NEF supporter on this call, then thank you very much. We appreciate it. If you are not, then check out the link we are posting in the chat now. Okay, let's move on to our next speaker. We are going to spend the rest of this briefing speaking to commissioners on the UK Women's Budget Group report on the care-led recovery. First up, we have Neil Lawson, Executive Director of Compass. Thanks so much for talking to us, Neil. Are you out there? I am, hopefully so. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, hi, Sophie. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. I really want to give a big thank to my fellow um, uh, commissioners from the Women's Budget Group Commission, Zeva and Anne, who are on the call. But I, I also spotted Diane Elson, who chaired it in the, um, uh, in, the, in the audience. And D Diane did a brilliant job, as did all of the staff. It was like a textbook way to run a commission. Um, it was beautifully done, beautifully handled, so well organised, so well delivered, had, has had a huge impact. So it was a it was a really absolutely uh, top effort, and I'd really like to thank everyone for, for their contribution. Um, I'd also like to thank Neff um, for putting on tonight. And, and in honour of Neff, I'm just going to do quick um, four quick news, Sophie. So um, um, uh, why the care agenda is important in in four new ways. Um, uh, but let me say, I mean, I see care as almost kind of with like the equivalent at the same level of the other big um, transformative um, issue beginning with C, climate. It's, it's a way into a conversation about a different kind of society and a different kind of life. It forces us to have um, transformative conversations, transformative ideas and transformative practice like no other. And that's why I was keen to be part of the um, uh, Women's Budget Group's brilliant um, uh, uh, commission. So in honour of NEF, what are my four, um, four news uh, very quickly? My first new is, is a new ethic. The reason that I think care is so important is it kind of it completely counterposed to the ethic of, of neoliberalism, an ethic of individualism and an ethic of com competition. And what it pro proposes is an ethic of solidarity, of love, of empathy, of vulnerability, of dependency. Um, and it's such a different kind of flavour to it and sentiment um, that the two things become incompatible. And it speaks to, you know, the, the, the best in us. 
we always have to recognize there's a competitive side in us and there's an in individualistic side in us and that's okay but the point of politics is to bring out what we think is the best in people and a care agenda brings out the best in people because it brings out all of that stuff that i think most makes us human and what make uh, and what we feel is most important to us so my first new is a new ethic the second new is a new economics and uh, um, i'm sure um, Anne and others will talk more about that but a, but a kind of you know the the neoliberalism you know it goes back to the forces us to be individualistic and forces us to be competitive and it forces us to work you know before the enclosures before the poor laws you know we cared for our family and our kin and our community and were like or so awfully uprooted out of those lives. Now, I'm not saying that we want to go back to that stuff. It wasn't all good. But there was, you know, the time and the ability for people to care for themselves. Uh, and the new care agenda will hopefully, you know, end the domination of competition, cons turbo consumerism, rampant individualism, and, and help us create a much more kind of balanced economy. Um, and going back to, you know, whether it is a, 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 an income guarantee or whether it's a basic income, you know, whether it's a four day week or just shorter hours in general, it forces all of those issues onto the table for a new kind of economics. Um, my, thir my third new is new practices, because one of the reasons I've been so interested in the care sector is it's so creative and so innovative. I don't think the answers to a new care settlement lie, you know, solely with, I mean, they certainly don't lie with the private sector, although it will have its place. You know, some care homes are run incredibly well by incredibly care, caring people. Um, uh, and we shouldn't kind of, you know, just brush that aside um, without thinking. But I don't think this is just the thing about the big state either. You know, how much can the big bureaucratic state love and care, question mark? Clearly, it has to provide resources and it has to provide levels of regulation and standards. But actually, what's so great about the, the, the sector is how innovative and creative it, it is. You know, whether you look at uh, models like the, the, the Dutch Burtzog nursing care model, which, you know, gives complete autonomy to the staff to run their practice. If you look at things like shared lives, which kind of, you know, looks at the capacity in the community and tries to match people you know, with need and wants and putting them together in clever kinds of ways. If you look at the way individual budgets have been used for people to kind of develop their own care packages there. And that's just a flavor of it. It is absolutely the most creative and innovative sector because it's one that people, you know, have to in where the big state doesn't work and the free market's not working. People are innovating and creating all sorts of new institutions in, no, new, in all sorts of new ways. So that was my third new. Um, my final uh, new, um, you wouldn't be surprised from someone from Compass, is that the care agenda insists on a new politics. Look, this is so big um, that no single party, it's so complicated and so big that no party, single party, is going to be able to get their head and their arms around this. It's going to take cooperation. Um, it's kind of, you know, what we need is beverage on stilts. You know, and in a sense, beverage was quite easy to, to put in place because of the kind of fullest moment where you could just kind of churn the machine out. Now, in a kind of network society, it's complicated. It, it is about relationships. It is about ecosystems. It is about networks. It is about trust. It's about a whole load of things. And you can't go into a politics and an ethic and a practice of care and not care about all sorts of other people and just be a kind of dominant monopoly um, uh, party player. So it's going to mean kind of cooperation between the national, the local, the very local, between civil society, between all sorts of different players and parties. So it's going to force us into you know, a, a very different kind of place. So I think care you know, um, uh, can be you know, just like climate, you know, the thing that forces all of us to practice things in a different way, to work in a different way. And, you know, what we have to do is transform our society. And that's why I'm so pleased with the, the way that the, um, the, the Commission's report has been received. And now let's work on that and build on that. Great. Thank you so much, Neil. That was fantastic. Um, very, very like 
upbeat it made me feel very energized in fact there is a comment in the chat um from sarah saying that your speech made them want to dance in their kitchen which is exciting. <laughs> so uh well done um we've got a couple of questions here um one from lucy craig from in the chat um who says isn't the problem that this government isn't listening and is unlikely to do so for the foreseeable future yeah, I, I don't know really. I mean, I think I think like all things, it's complicated. I mean, there, there are some people in the uh, Conservative Party that, that will be listening, and um, there'll be there'll be certainly there'll be MPs in the red wall seats that are quite attuned to to much of this agenda. And um, there could be other thinkers. I mean, I haven't looked at it in detail yet, but I know a lot of people are talking quite a lot about Danny Kruger's report on civil society and communities. I think as ever, you find the cracks find the spaces in which, you know, we can open things out, you know, and even if the, you know, the Conservative Party as a whole, you know, isn't going to be very supportive, there will be people in those places. Certainly in local government, a lot of councils led by uh, Conservatives will be very amenable to a, a, a new care agenda. Um, so I think, you know, we, we, we always look for the best in people. That's what a caring society does. You know, whatever party label, whatever, row, you know, colour rose they wear, um, uh, Rosette, you know, let's look at, you know, f go for the best in people and then we'll surprise, you know, even if we're just disarming them. Um, so I, I think that's always, you know, always the best approach. But we shouldn't wait for governments. That's what I love about the care sector. It's about us and what we can do and how powerful we can be and what we can invent and how we can treat each other, you know. And of course, we want a, a, a kind of, you know, a government to come along and help with the funding and the regulation and all the rest of it. Absolutely. But let's not be disempowered in the meantime. And that's what it goes back to. There are so many brilliant people doing so many brilliant things and we can kind of like, you know, I don't know if it's scaling it up, but making that the predominant practice of people helping people, then, you know, it doesn't matter what the political parties do. You know, we're so far ahead of them. Great, thank you. Um, I mean, maybe this is the answer, this is the same, but, um, uh, Jill Bird in the chat says, does this come back to past ideological tendencies that the market knows best and we must not, we must not make corporations pay their taxes? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think a society run on a care ethic, you know, that creates much greater kind of, you know, moral um, uh, uh, force on, on companies to... Uh, uh, pay their taxes but it, it almost does more than that doesn't it it forces the companies themselves to behave differently that's why i'm so interested in kind of developments like you know the b corp movement i mean i don't think they put care as part of their kind of triple bottom line but but you know companies and businesses aren't just centers of profit making they are centers of responsibility and care and looking after their stakeholders. That's why the, the, why the concept of care is so beautiful because it runs into everything. It runs into family, it runs into the state, it runs into business, it runs into civil service. And that's why the concept of the caring economy and more importantly, the caring society is absolutely, absolutely critical to a future politics because it invades quite rightly every space and should, and should you know, be the predominant ethic in every space. If we get it there in the right kind of way, then we change society. So it's a battering ram for a, for a, you know, for a, for a, a better good society. And it's the way we behave on the way to it. You know, we, we will win a caring society by being caring and loving and empathetic ourselves. And so it becomes a win-win. Thanks, Neil. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, and I feel energized and I feel more optimistic after hearing you speak about that. So thanks very much. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Zubaida Hack, former interim director of the Runnymede Trust and member of the Independent Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, SAGE. It's great to have you with us, Zubaida. Are you there? Yeah, there you yes. are. Yes. Hi. Hi. Thank you, Sophie. And hello, everybody. It's fantastic. It's fantastic to have you all here this time of the evening. Um, and I'm really happy that Neil um, gave you that energy because I don't know if I can match that. But it is an honor and a privilege to be here um, to talk about a caring economy. It's also an honor and a privilege to represent the Commission, the Women's Budget Group Commission on Gender Equal Economy. Um, and it's fantastic to have Diane Elson with us tonight. Um, 
I'm going to come at this. Oh, and by the way, thank you very much, Enia, for inviting us. This is wonderful to meet you all and be here. Um, I'm going to come at this really um, from the perspective of um, my two sort of hats that I've been wearing recently. And one is as the former interim director of the Runnymede Trust. I don't know if you know about the Runnymede Trust, but it is a um, national race equality think tank. I, I, I was there until very recently. I was there for four and a half years. But um, Runnymede was very much at the heart, at the heart of, um, if you like, pushing government, getting government and decision makers and policy makers in public health England to recognize the disproportionate hospital cases and um, deaths among BME communities in relation to COVID-19. And I'm also going to come at you with the hat of um, being a member of Independent SAGE, who was set up in April by the former um, Chief Scientific Advisor, Sir David King, who believed that the science that was leading um, this pandemic wasn't necessarily being um, coming through via government. It was being filtered and we wanted to bring the science to government. Um, and of course, sorry, I'm also coming to you as a commissioner on the Women's Bo uh, Budget Group on Gender Equal Economy. And the way that all those things come together, I think, is through this, which is that COVID-19, I believe, on the one hand, showed us what a caring economy could look like. It gave us a real glimpse, which after Brexit was a wonderful glimpse, really. It gave us a glimpse of what it is like and what it means to care for each other, what it means to care for your neighbours, what it means to care for vulnerable people, and what it means to care for those people who until recently by this government had been described as unskilled workers. You know, in other words, what we now call frontline key workers and what it means to put them at the fore, what, what it means for them, how important their roles are, how valuable their roles are. And I believe that COVID-19 brought all of that to the fore and reminded us of what a caring economy, what a caring society looks like, but also what caring people, who they are and why they need to be valued. But on the other hand, of course, what COVID-19 showed us very starkly is that depending on where you are on the economic ladder depending on what, what your demographic characteristics are if you are female if you're from a, a black ethnic minority group if you are disabled depending on where you are the outcomes in your life were predicted by that and not only were the outcomes in your life predicted by that the lower you were on the economic ladder the more insecure, the more precarious, the more you were on the front line. Not only were those outcomes in terms of health poorer, but just like George Floyd's murder showed us, it demonstrated that inequality was the difference between matter, was the difference between a matter of life and death. And I know that sounds quite harsh, but the reality is, is that's exactly what it was. That's exactly why black and ethnic minority groups are disproportionately more likely to die from COVID-19. It's not about biology. There's no one gene for being black. There's no one gene for being Asian. Um, this is about pre-existing racial and social class inequalities coming to the fore, coming to the fore and showing us that depending on what the circumstances are in your life, depending on where you live, whether you live in a deprived area, whether you live in overcrowded housing, whether you live in multi-generational housing, whether you are forced to choose between unsafe work and putting food on the table, your entire life outcomes are not only insecure and not only precarious, but you are more likely to die. Your life is more likely to be shortened. I put that starkly because that, of course, reminds us of why it's important to have a caring economy. And what I loved about being on the Commission on Gender Equal Economy is not only did it remind us that inequalities matter, that inequalities make a difference to the outcomes in your life. It also reminded us that being female, being female and that intersectional inequality of being female, of coming from low socioeconomic groups, of being from a black and ethnic minority group, 
makes a huge difference to the outcomes in your life. Makes life not just a little bit more difficult, but actually has very stark outcomes. One of the things that I remember very clearly from COVID-19 recently was reading an article about how black women were, and we know this, we've known this for a long time, that black women are five times more likely to die in pregnancy, um, including six weeks postpartum, um, uh, because, because of their characteristics, because of their demographic characteristics. But what COVID-19 showed us was they were eight times more likely to be hospitalized because of COVID-19 as well. It's the same for Asian women. Well, the, 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 the outcomes are slightly better, but not, not that much better. And it's the same for mixed race. In other words, it does make a difference what racial background you're from. What It does make a difference what socioeconomic um, class you're from. And if you are a female, because you are generally lower paid because your work is more precarious and we know that we know that that females are much more likely to be in those industries that have been shut down we know that they're much more likely since covid since covid hit us that they were much more likely to be furloughed they were much more likely to have lost their jobs they were much more likely to be responsible for health care and so on all of those things not only impact on women's careers, on their progression in their careers, but also mean that they're much more likely to be in debt. COVID-19 has not been a friend for many women out there, and it's not been a friend for um, black and ethnic minority groups. And if you look at the intersectional aspects of that, then it's been quite devastating. So for me, a caring economy means so much for me as the former interim director of Ray of Runnymede Trust, as, as a member of Independent Sage, as a member of the Commission on Gender Equal Economy, for me, a caring economy not only means that it you need to take into account the needs and circumstances of people's lives so that lives can be better, they can be improved, so that they're more equal, but it also means that we need to take account of the structural inequalities. Because if you don't, as I mentioned, it's not just a question of poorer outcomes. It's also a question, or if you, you like, a difference between life and death. Now I said at the beginning, thank goodness Neil was the energy. I don't want to end on a depressing note because I do think we have an extraordinary opportunity here. We saw the love for each other. We saw how much we cared for each other. Um, and we still continue to see that. And I think what we can do is, is take that energy and take that compassion for each other and um, have a new normal. We don't want to go back to the old normal. So let's bring about a new normal. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Zubaida. That was amazing. Um, very interesting and not at all downbeat, just very, very detailed. Um, I mean, there's a few questions um, in the chat I, that I will come to maybe, but um, the first question I have for you really is where do we even begin um, on these things? You know, you talked very, like, in a lot of detail there about all the different inequalities that exist already. And obviously there's been so much, so much evidence, you know, all the Michael Marmot stuff, all of that sort of thing. Like this has been going on for so long. I mean, is it a case of just, we need to start from scratch? Like where do we start tackling the stuff that, that is at the root of these problems, do you think? I mean, that's a very good question, Sophie. It does seem quite overwhelming, but I think we start from where we're at, which is during COVID, in the, in the midst of a pandemic, the one thing we know that really matters that makes a difference between, you know, um, if you like going to unsafe work and putting food on the table and, and life and death is a stronger safety net, is a stronger security um, stronger welfare and um, security safety net. And if we have that, then people don't have to make hard choices between putting food on the table and, and, um, 
and, and, and going to unsafe work. And I say that because time and time again, Runnymede Trust worked closely with the anti-poverty sector. We worked closely with, with the women's sector. What we found is time and time again, people were being placed in those positions. What we found on Independent Sage was that as much as we were saying, the evidence says that unless you isolate, we can't beat this pandemic unless you isolate, test and trace doesn't matter. People were not isolating because they simply couldn't afford to isolate. And so that stronger safety net, social security safety net matters. But we also know from the Commission on Gender and Equal Economy that that matters for women in particular. Women rely on it much more because they are disproportionately likely to be in insecure, in insecure um, and precarious work. We know that black women are the biggest group that are likely to be on zero hour contracts. So all of that matters. All of that matters, not only in terms of your outcomes, but in terms of choices. And I think it's one of those conversations that we really haven't had, we haven't really talked about the difference between enforced choice and positive choice. And what we want in the caring economy is for people to be able to make positive choices. Great, thank you so much. That was a brilliant answer. Um, I'm gonna move us on just because we're, we don't wanna run out of time, but thanks so much for, um, thanks so much for your really detailed answers and for joining us tonight. And we really appreciate it. And also we really appreciate you joining us from a galaxy far, far away sitting in front of that Star Wars poster, which is one of the best backgrounds I've ever seen on a new economics briefing. <laughs> uh, okay, um, right, last but absolutely not least is a uh, friend of NEF and director of Prime Economics and NEF fellow, not just friend of NEF, um, friend of the show, friend of everyone, uh, Anne Pettifor. Welcome to the briefing, Anne. It's so lovely to see you. Can we hear you? Well, you're on mute, Anne. Yeah. Hi, am I muted now? I'm muted. Right. Okay. There we go. Um, how are you? I hope you're okay. Um, yeah. uh, we, you, you think that building a caring economy is an important way of dealing with the climate emergency, apparently. I think you do. Why do you think this? Why do I think that? Well, I think that because, well, first of all, can I say, before ru rushing into this, that I, I too am very proud to have been a commissioner on this uh, gender equal economy, the world, women, but women's budget groups, gender equal economy. Um, and I'm hoping very much that we can turn this into the beverage report of our day. And I thank Neff for the role that you are playing as well in helping us promote this report and making it as important to our society as beverage was in 1945. Um, yeah, no, I think it's absolutely, we need for, for a climate economy, for a green economy, for a sustainable economy, we need to take undertake work that is not in a sense um, greenhouse gas emitting. Uh, and, it's, and that's going to be ma mainly service work and, you know, care work is, is service work. And of course there are um, emissions uh, linked to that work, but on the whole, it is much cleaner uh, economic activity than many much of the work in manufacturing and so on and airlines and so on so it's really fundamental um in that sense in terms of the green economy but i, I think it's much deeper than that and I, I wanted as a start if i may also to plug this little book by the care collective which is the care manifesto which opens with an essay by lynn siegel in which she says our world is one in which carelessness reigns. Um, and this was made most explicit by the pandemic in that we were so careless of the threat of a pandemic, which actually we had been warned of. Um, Professor Ian Golden of Oxford University has been writing about the threat of pandemics for some time. And furthermore, he, are, he warns us that there are further pandemics in the pipeline. Um, because of the way in which we've invaded a uh, nature space, if you like, and found ourselves in conflict with nature, um, acquiring nature's habitat and in the process um, disturbing nature and, and, and attracting these viruses. So, so he warned about this, but we were too careless to care, really. And I think um, we really have to 
change that attitude if, if we are concerned about our own survival. So I want to argue that, first of all, the thing that struck me most, and I was really struck by what Zubay said about um, COVID and what it brought out in terms of community, self-help organizations, mutual aid, in my bit of Suffolk here, which is deeply conservative, it was quite extraordinary how people came together to help those that you know, needed prescriptions, that needed care, those who couldn't connect with their families, you know, this was uh, the work that happened was just out of the blue spontaneous and really and obviously also substituting for so much work that ought to have been done by the social services and wasn't done. So what COVID showed us was that the rich and powerful in this world, the, 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 the millionaire footballers, the people paid millions of bucks to, to play a game, uh, the bosses of airlines, you know, people like Richard Branson, big bad oligarchs were totally irrelevant to the economy. They really were irrelevant. They just weren't there, they weren't needed. And what was really important to the economy was the work of care workers, health workers, truck drivers, shelf stackers, all of those people in the lowliest jobs, in the low, most low paid jobs were actually absolutely vital not just to our survival, and they were vital to our survival, but also to the functioning of the economy. And for me, the tragedy is that there isn't enough awareness of that potential power, of how actually this, you know, Mr. Bezos, and if you listen carefully, you can hear him making another billion dollars as we speak, right? Mr. Bezos's business would not have functioned without the low paid, low skilled, and insecure work that was done by thousands of people delivering his parcels and continue to do so. So we, we really need to understand the importance of, these, of this sector to the functioning of the economy and therefore the leverage that we, that work in those sectors have over the economy. And I want us to understand that actually we are the ones who make the economy. And if we make the economy, then we ought to be able to shape it to suit what we what we're looking for and not and not what the bosses are looking for if you like so i want to argue that you know we need to rediscover that power the second point i want to make is that the economics of all of this is incredibly sexist if you like when we talk about investment or we talk about public investment and we talk about investment in infrastructure we're talking about blokes getting jobs building railway lines or hospitals or you know in construction or engineering all of that kind of stuff building bridges right we don't think of care as part of our infrastructure as part of the infrastructure of our economy as well as society and i want us to be pushing that idea that actually investing in care is is part of investing in the infrastructure of society and I, I've worked in Africa and I've worked in societies that lack that infrastructure, that don't have decent education systems, that certainly don't have decent social care systems and that don't have health systems. And as a result, they have very, very weak or non-functioning economies. And so I think we've got to change our view of care as part of an investment of the structural investment we need the infrastructural investment we need to make the economy function and it's as important as building railway lines if not more right and um, finally I want to make this point and I think it's a point also that is often not understood by women in particular and that is that you know care is is on the whole low paid activity it is uh, activity which is is not trained up which is not provided with additional skills with the kind of investment in skills that is needed to upgrade that care um, and it's insecure work but above all it's really really low paid work and i want to argue that that has a massive impact on the public finances and that we should begin to argue that in order to fix the government's budget, we have to raise the wages of women and, and men engaged in care, in care work. And by doing so, we will increase their incomes and that will increase revenues for, for those individuals 
for families and for, for, for society, but also for the private sector. But above all, it will increase revenues for the government to help pay for the investment, right? And so part of the reason we have a budget deficit, part of the reason that public finances are out of kilt is because we have such low pay because, you know, and, and it's insecure. And so many people therefore don't really pay taxes and therefore the government doesn't actually get the kind of revenues it needs to balance the budget. So we are fundamental to the function of the economy, this work, as well as to the public finances. These are leverage points that I want us to grasp and to understand and to argue for in order to further empower those who work in the care sector, because after all, we need them, as we discovered during the pandemic, for our very survival. Thank you. No, thank you, Anne. As ever, so interesting. Um, it was fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, let's go back and just focus a little bit on climate change again um, for the question we're going to come to. Um, on the very day that the big man himself, David Attenborough, finally mentioned capitalism in relation to the climate, what a day! So, on the on the uh, on the on on the subject of climate of climate change. Uh, Nikki in the chat is asking, how is care part of the solution to climate change? Well, care is, is, is a service. It's part of the service sector. It's not manufacturing. It doesn't rely necessarily on the extraction of assets from the earth, uh, from the earth's finite resources. It's something, um, it's a person to person, it's a people to people uh, form of activity. And in that sense, it less emitting a uh, greenhouse gas emitting than our extract the extractive industries and the manufacturing industries and we just need to think about it in those terms but it's also vital because as we know and as professor golden and others have warned there are shocks in the pipeline and those shocks are going to be climate related shocks and they're going to include pandemics basically but whatever kind of climate shock it's going to be, we're going to need care to, because as human, for if human civilization is to survive. So it's fundamental in my view. Brilliant, thank you, Anne. Um, second question uh, from Naira uh, in the chat, um, who is a counselor uh, and asks in a, in a fairly pleading tone, I think, uh, I know this question has been partly dealt with, but could you enlighten us about how we put massive funding for this change into a caring society and economy into action? It's really hard to imagine how we promote such a transformation with continuous cuts and lack of national investment. I think we have to ask ourselves where the Bank of England and the Treasury found, I don't know, a thousand billion pounds uh, to bail out the corporate sector uh, through the pandemic. And where they found a thousand, more than a thousand billion pounds. Actually, the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve of the United States found more money this in this crisis than they had in in the case, and, and then they used, then they mobilised uh, for the Great Financial Crisis. And in the case of the Federal Reserve, it was more money that was than that mobilised for the Great Financial Crisis, plus all the money that was used to finance World War II. That's how much money was able to be found to bail out in, in 2008-9, the finance sector, and in 2020, uh, the corporate sector. So, you know, the good thing about our new Chancellor is that he dispelled the idea that there is no money, magic money tree. <laughs> It's no longer possible to argue, as the previous prime minister had argued, that there is no magic money tree. There is a magic money tree. Uh, my view is we can't just go on spending, that we have to, we have to find a way to finance that investment, to, to finance that money creation, if you like, that comes via the Bank of England and the Treasury. And for us to be able to do that means we've got to create jobs, because jobs create uh, jobs and employment, create economic activity, which generates income, as I said, for the individuals and for, for the private sector. But above all, it creates tax revenues with which to pay for 
the initial investment, which comes in the form of, if you like, um, new money generated by the Bank of England in the first place. It's a bit like when we, we have to take out a mortgage from the bank, we're able to raise very large sums of money against collateral, and then we earn money month after month in order to repay it back. And it, that's precisely how the public finances work. And we, we know that the Central Bank, the Bank of England and the Treasury has the capacity to issue bonds to finance this stuff. So partly in answer to the question, I want to argue this. There is no question we have, there is money to pay for this. We have to understand where the money comes from. We have to, in my view, sort of teach ourselves about the way in which the monetary system works, why it is that you can mobilize a thousand billion bucks for the corporate sector, but not for the, the care sector. We've got to understand that instead of thinking that everything gets paid for just by paying taxes. That is a very simplistic view of the way in which we would fund local government spending on care. It's not paid for by taxes. It's paid for by investment through, through borrowing, essentially, by the government. And that investment in jobs, and the, the other thing about the care sector is that it's a job-rich sector, right? It requires an awful lot of people to be working in it, generates income revenues, to pay for the investment. And we must got to get our head around that stuff. And we must be ready to argue on monetary policy, uh, in monetary policy debates in order to make the case for there is, there is money for this. Can I assure you there is money for this? The only question is, how do we, who decides where that money goes and, and, and who benefits from it? And at the moment, we, in a sense, because we don't fully understand the process, we don't put pressure on our politicians mm -hmm. to direct money towards these sectors and to, and to stop directing it mm -hmm. towards the Richard Bransons of this world, you know, who went around begging for a bailout, even though he doesn't pay taxes in this country. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I hope that's not too general an answer to the question about where the money comes from, but I, th there is money. It's there. We, right. have to, we have to be empowered to understand it and, and to, to make it happen, put pressure on the politicians. Thank you, Anne. I always learn so much from you. Uh, Zuba, you don't want it to come in, I think. Well, yes, I mean, God, Anne's absolutely right. You know, money's always there whenever the government need it for their own purposes, including test and trace. And, um, you know, we heard today that Deloitte has earned hundreds of millions, but we still don't have a functioning test and trace. And yet when it comes to supporting people in isolation, you know, in, the, in terms of the pandemic or people out of work, um, you know, money's not there. So I think that's an important conversation to have. I was going to take a bit of a step back and say, actually, as well as talking about money and the availability of money, I think we need to challenge things on a narrative basis as well. I think we need to not only say this is an opportunity to look at the economy and how we can have more economic inequality, economic equality, Freudian slip, um, but also challenge some of the terms that we've been using for such a long time that has demeaned the caring work that people do. Like, economic inactivity economic inactivity, inactivity is a horrible word you know there is no and especially when it comes to women there's no such thing as a woman who doesn't work there are only women who are not paid for their work and i think it's important to challenge terms like that i think it's important to not just talk about unemployed people without recognizing the barriers to employment without recognizing that you can't talk about at the moment it's really interesting um, there's lots of talk about post-covid reco recovery economic wise skills skills and productivity what are viable jobs and so on and yet there is nothing in the background about how child care housing transport the social security system all of those issues care how how that not how not only should that be embraced but how they can also hold people back because it's not valued because it's not compensated for by the state because it's not recognized as an important job so i think we also need to have that conversation as well 
Thank you so much. That was an excellent point. Um, we have very much run out of time this evening, everybody, I'm afraid, which, which is a shame because this has been an absolutely excellent conversation. Um, thanks again for UK Women's Budget Group for co-hosting this briefing with us. And just a reminder that you can read uh, you can read from Neil Zubeda and more in their report on building a caring economy, which we'll post in the chat again now. Uh, and also just a reminder that if you enjoyed this event and want to support NEF in our work, you can support, you can sign up to our supporters network today from as little as three pounds a month. What a bargain. Supporters help to fund our work, including helping us to continue run, continue to run events like this and take the fight for a new economy to the widest audience possible. We'll post a link again in the chat to the supporters network page now. We have a really exciting programme of online events lined up over the next few months, including a deeper dive into what a green recovery package could look like, which is on the 29th of October. To stay up to, up to date uh, on these things and for updates on all of our work, then please do sign up to our mailing list if you are not on it already. We are posting a link in the chat to that now. Um, so thanks once again to Neil Lawson, Zubay Hack and Petafor and uh, our very own Sarah Arnold, uh, Senior Economist at NEF. Uh, thanks so much to all of you for speaking. It's been a great conversation and thanks so much to all of you for coming.